last lecture by Conway. Okay, so um, so you know, uh, every now and then. Uh, I have a, a sort of real problem in that I'm explaining something to somebody um, and they see it's trivial and they discount it, you know. And uh, the thing is, uh, you know, that, uh, at least I hope, it's only tri trivial after I've done it. Everything I've ever done is trivial, you know, <laughs> utterly trivial. But before I did it, it wasn't, <laughs> when everyone else was doing it. Um, okay, so I, I sort of have done a few of those trivial things. I trivialized the Hasse-Minkowski theorem statement, and it's proof, but I haven't given you the, uh, the proof here. Um, and uh, this is rather funny, because uh, I'm now going to say what's special about low dimensions. Uh, you know, the theory does get rather easy. <laughs> in low dimensions, and that's the uh, oldest case, dimension two, uh, binary quadratic forms. You know, the theory was started off by various Indian mathematicians quite a few centuries ago, um, uh, completed essentially, well, no, I shouldn't say completed by Legendre, but it put in modern form uh, by Legendre quite early <laughs> um, uh, in the uh, his uh, number theory book, uh, which is uh, 17 something, uh, anyway, um, uh, he proved uh, the famous four squares theorem in 1770. It's a difficult thing. Oh, sorry, that's uh, La La Lagrange, I meant to say, not uh, Legendre. Um, Legendre proved the three squares theorem in uh, 1798. These are fantastic dates, I think. And Gauss wiped the floor with the theory in his Disquisitiones. Um, but still, uh, you know, I didn't uh, sort of really get the point until after I wrote the sphere packing book with Neil Sloan, and then my little book called The Sensual Quadratic Form. And uh, this made it utterly trivial. So let me sort of try and uh, show you what happens. Suppose I've got the quadratic form a x squared plus uh, b x y plus c y squared. I, I want to write down some values of it. Uh, well, the value at one comma naught is a. Right. Uh, the value at naught comma one is c. Now these are actually, it's a quadratic form, so it's actually the value of both 1, 0 and it's negative. Um, now what's the value of 1, 1 and it's negative? a plus b plus c. Well I'll write it as a plus c <coughs> plus b. And as plus or minus 1 minus 1, it is uh, a plus c minus b. Right, now I'm going to put a little circle around a plus c here, and around a and c here, and around a plus c here, and you'll see that these, uh, let's, let's call them the three circled numbers, are in arithmetic progression. Okay, a plus c minus b, a plus c, a plus c plus b. Um, and uh, now, you know, this is a vector which we'll call u. This is a vector we might call v. This is u minus v. And this is u plus v. Um, and uh, so this is a rule for sort of proceeding. Let me just take a case. Uh, let me take the case of the quadratic form 4x squared plus 3xy minus 2y squared. But by the way, perhaps I should say first, um, I'm going to concentrate on indefinite forms here uh, because uh, that's what 
the what's completely solved by Eichler's theory in dimension at least three. Um, and so what's wrong with it in dimension two? Well, it's not right. But I want to say, you know, you can say, say everything in, in dimension two anyway. So in this case, we get four here, minus two here. Uh, they add up to two, and so we add three to that to get five. And uh, we subtract three from it uh, to get what? Minus one. Is that what I had before? I must get it right because otherwise. Oh, yeah, minus one. Uh, okay. Um, well, let's. Uh, the, the thing is determined by any of these numbers around here. So I'm going to continue. So I'll, I'll start off like this uh, 4 minus 2, 5. Now, let's see what it is at the sum of these two vectors. Remember, this vector was u, and this vector was u plus v. And this vector is uh, u, uh, is v. Uh, what, uh, where, what is it like at the sum of these two? That is to say, u plus 2v. Well, I continue the AP. Minus 2 to 1. That went up by 3. Oh, God. I'm making mistakes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I made a difference. Minus 2 to 9. That went up by 11. This is really hard. Uh, so we'll go up by 11 again, and we get that f of u plus 2 is 20. Uh, there's another vector over here, which is the sum of these two vectors. The difference has already appeared here. Uh, 4 to 25, that went up by 21. Oh, dear me, it's getting big, you know. 5 to 24, that went up by 19 to 43. It, it doesn't seem to be a good idea to go in these directions, and things are getting really big. Okay, it turns out that the, the, the best thing to do is to stay near the river. The river is the line that separates positive from negative values. So, uh, I'm staying near the river. Well, uh, I'll just remind you what happens if I go away from the river first. <laughs> I'm in a tree on the riverbank. Okay, four to three to two. Five to zero to minus five. Minus two to minus three to minus four. Uh, where are we? F minus 5 to minus 2 to plus. Uh, well, you know what's happening here? This here became a, a, a rotation point of the figure. It negates the form. So I don't really need to carry on along that. Uh, okay, so I'll go backwards. Um, 5 to 2. <laughs> 5 to 2 to minus 1. Uh, minus 2 to 3, I went up by 5, so I'll go up by 5 again to get 8. Um, uh, where are we? 4 to 7. Uh, I'm putting it at the top or the bottom according as it's negative. So this horizontal line is the river I spoke of. So wait a moment. 4 to 7 to 10. Uh, 8 to 9 to 10. 10 to 9 to 8, 4. Ah, it, it went into reverse here. Um, so altogether, uh, I can now sort of see all the values. Well, let me just explain what I mean. I can see all the, the um, perhaps the best word is to say the primitive values. By the way, minus 4 to 3, added 7 uh, to 10. 1 to 12, I added 11 to 23. Uh, you know, 2 to 11, I added 9 uh, to 20 and so on. I mean, if, if I go away from the river, it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, if I want to um, find all the values of this form up to 100, say all the positive values of this form up to 100, uh, what do I do? Well, it turns out that 
the vectors that you know I get here. Remember these vectors, were, uh, which we were really evaluating the form, are all primitive vectors. They are, every single primitive vector happens here. Um, and what what does a, a non-primitive vector mean? It means that it's a multiple of some smaller vector. So I get all all the values. These are all the primitive values in the standard jargon. I get all the values by multiplying these numbers by squares. <laughs> okay. Um, so look, I can see that this form does not represent three. Okay. Uh, does it represent seven? Well, uh, it's no good going up these trees. <laughs> um, uh, we've gone up this tree. Uh, minus t 2 to 7. Oh, well, that's already adds up to 7, so this will be more. Uh, no, it doesn't represent 7. <laughs> okay, because I've, I've explored essentially all possibilities. Does it represent minus 23? Well, I could go down here and see what happens. So this, in a certain sense, enables you to see all the values. It enables you to solve the representation problem. It also enables you to solve the equivalence problem. If I take another form and try to... Um, uh, and draw this picture, then the two forms are equivalent if and only if you get the same picture, essentially. So that's really rather nice. That trivializes uh, the various the problems, the equivalence problem. It's, it's a, an algorithm, not anything else. Uh, and it's known in the literature by the term Gauss's cycles of reduced forms. They're equivalent to Gauss's cycles of reduced forms. But this makes Gauss's cycles of reduced forms obvious from the start. Um, now, what was I going to say? Uh, the, uh, I think I'd co I'll comment briefly on the two different kinds of integrality. Um, uh, Legendre's it took his standard quadratic form to be x squared plus bxy plus cy squared, where a, b, and c were integers. And so all values of the, of the form were integers. And, you know, that's the general quadratic form, all of whose values are integers. So I call it integer valued, if you like. Um, the discriminant of this is this function b squared minus ac. Now the trouble is that the matrix is not integral. The matrix has to halve b. And so Gauss preferred to have the matrix integral and took his standard quadratic form to be ax squared plus 2bxy plus c y squared. So this is an example of an integer matrix form because the matrix is integral. Um, and here it's natural to take the determinant. So there are two schools, you know, some people follow Legendre, some people follow Gauss. Uh, some people... Uh, you know, are so passionately devoted to one school uh, that they insult the other. Watson, for instance, um, talks of Gauss's mistake of putting these binomial coefficients in here. But really, the two definitions are for two slightly different purposes. If you're a number theorist, you are probably interested in the values represented by the form, so you prefer this. If you are um, another kind of mathematician, say a topologist, you're probably interested in the geometry of the lattice and you want all integral products to be and you, and you prefer this. Um, I try not to discriminate. So, you know, I, I like the idea of using either. But I want you to notice that if you do, if you change in between the two, you've got a factor of minus four between what is called the discriminant and the determinant. Um, okay. Uh, Right. Um, so, uh, what's the genus? Uh, okay, there's another thing that's very special in term, uh, in two dimensions, and that is there is Gauss's composition group. Um, and basically, what it, it is, it's for imprimitive forms of given determinant or discriminant. I mean, depends which way we're writing the theory. Um, imprimitive means not, not all the values are divisible by some constant. Um, and what it does, by the way, 
Lagrange already knew about this <laughs> in some sense, so did Legendre. Um, but uh, the concept of group wasn't yet available, and uh, the previous uh, definitions had two alternatives because you couldn't distinguish between a form and its inverse. So, uh, but uh, Gauss was very proud of the fact that he managed to put it in the right context. And what it does, um, say, let's let's say F composed with G, the va has values for the products of values of f and values of g. Um, and it's normally sort of written about in a, a very mealy-mouthed way. Um, it, it's rather hard to compose two forms. The reason it's hard to compose two forms is uh, you need to put them to some kind of compatible basis before you can multiply them. Uh, now, I, I want to remark that, um, okay, let, let me go back and talk, talk about this. Uh, B is, is the difference, this is in the, uh, this is in the uh, Legendre notation. Um, A, uh, what, I, what I'm deciding to do, sorry, A plus C plus B, what I'm doing here is uh, I told you that you had a diff an, an arithmetic progression. I'm writing B for the difference of that arithmetic progression, and I'm writing it on the edge. Uh, B is the difference of the AP. Okay? And uh, uh, and for forms of given discriminant or whatever it is, discriminant is the appropriate word here. Uh, A and B determines the form. You know, the form is specified by A and B because you can work out C because what is it? Four AC minus B squared is the discriminant. Well, you can work it out provided A is non-zero. I right? will not bother with the zero case. Um, okay, so it suffices to, to say, I mean, I want to know what the, uh, the composition of A, B and A prime, B prime is, okay? Um, well, the answer is, uh, well, first of all, let's look at this. Um, up here, we'll get A plus C plus B, because B was the difference of the AP. And then let's look at the difference of this AP. We went from A and we, were, we got to 2A plus C plus B. Uh, so the difference is B plus 2A. Okay. So, so let's remark that AB is equal to AB plus 2A. B is only really defined modulo 2a. You only need to know B modulo 2a. Um, so, anyway, let me tell you what is this. It's a a prime. That's the typical product of values. Big B. Where big B is congruent to little b modulo 2a and uh, to little b prime modulo 2a prime. Um, and of course, so, so a little b is equal to a big b because b is congruent to little b modulo 2. That's the multiplication law. Uh, well, provided, I'm sorry I didn't say this, provided a a prime is 1. Provided a and a prime are co-prime. Um, you won't find that simple way of saying it in any book, I don't think. But that's, well, I mean, you might. But, um, you know, that's, that's the way to do it. And under that kind of uh, composition, the, uh, the things form a group. Right. Now, why have I mentioned this group? Well, first of all, because it's there. It's very definitely there. And it's a wonderful thing. And if you're talking about binary quadratic forms, you'll want to know Gauss's composition law. 
Um, however, there's another reason. Uh, what's the genus? <laughs> it turns out that the genus is uh, G modulo G squared, where G is the composition group. So, in other words, uh, for binary forms, uh, two forms are, when are two forms in the same genus? When their ratio in the composition group is a perfect square. Okay? Uh, so, uh, the genus group is this. Oh, the genera, of course, form a group. The genus is a homomorphic image of the group. What about the spinner genus? It turns out it's G mod G to the fourth. So it's a refinement. Two things in the same spinner genus, if and only if they're quotient in the composition group, is a fourth power. I think that's probably uh, all I want to say about the binary case. The binary case is very special in that uh, there is a composition law. Um, it's not true. Eichler's theorem, you know, says uh, the spinner genus, uh, oh, sorry, what does it say? The spinner genus gives the class, provided the form is indefinite in a dimension at least three, and it isn't in, in uh, two dimensions. It's not just that Eichler wasn't clever enough to prove it, it isn't true. So you might want to know how to compute the spinner genus, um, and you also should want to know how the genus is relevant, you know, how the genus relates to the group. Um, and then I think, you know, I should blow my own trumpet again. If you actually want to solve any problems as to what the uh, numbers represented are, do it this way. <laughs> um, and that also solves many, many other problems, the equivalence problem. And it's easy to do, and it's fun to do, uh, you know, to write out these things. You can just sort of see everything you want to know about the thing. Uh, okay, now I want to move up to the next case, and that is when the dimension is three, indefinite forms of rank three. Um, and, uh, you know, the problem I've produced for the students, the project I've produced for the students, is to understand, or not, or at least to tabulate, uh, the indefinite forms of uh, rank three um, up to some given value of the determinant <laughs> and to understand the uh, uh, the automorphism groups of them. Uh, those are jobs that uh, the theory of composition does extremely well in the two-dimension case, uh, but in the three-dimensional case it's not so obvious. And let me tell you why I got interested in this pro problem. Uh, I got interested in this problem because, uh, you know, I knew that Eichler's notion of uh, spinner genus, or let's say genus, I mean, it, it, it's hardly different for the moment. It's an arithmetical notion, and, it you know, we have a complete arithmetical solution to the equivalence problem. Uh, how, about, how does that relate to the geometry? <laughs> it struck me because you can also work out the automorphism group and everything, get the geometry. And I still don't know. Um, and I thought it would be a good idea to produce a table of indefinite forms and see how, um, you know, indefinite forms for all the genera of uh, things, and uh, see how the arithmetic and the geometry uh, interface. So let me talk about the geometry of x squared plus y squared minus t squared. Now this is an indefinite quadratic form and so any vector in, in the space, this is a three-dimensional space, uh, you know, of, of values x, y, t. By the way, the typical point I call x, y, stroke t, so that you can see which is the one with the negative, which, which is the one that corresponds to the negative term. And I use t because these are time-like vectors in, in uh, standard treatments of relativity theory. Um, well, if you take uh, 
vectors in this space projectively, they are concepts in Lorentz, in, in the hyperbolic geometry. And uh, so let's try to, uh, sorry, this is going to be, I'll, I'll put this back when I sort of explain this. What we have here, there's a light cone, terminology is taken from relativity theory, um, and we are going to take vectors, and we wonder what corresponds to a vector. And it matters whether the vector is inside the cone, outside the cone, or, uh, or on the cone. And uh, it, the vectors with v dot v negative, well, they're the ones for which t is large compared to x and y. Uh, so they're in the inside of the cone. The vectors with v dot v equals naught are on the boundary of the cone, and v dot v positive uh, are outside the cone. And there are standard terminology. These are called time-like, these are called space-like, and these are called light-like. <laughs> um, but anyway, I mean, those terms, you know, are having physical relevance, not anything else. Now, uh, what we do now uh, is we there are two ways. Uh, I mean, when, when you take these projectively, in other words, you identify scalars, um, this three space becomes a two space, okay? It's three-dimensional Lorentzian space at the moment. It becomes two-dimensional hyperbolic space. And let me remind you, that's not you know, the hyperbolic plane. That's not the kind of hyperbolic plane that uh, various other speakers have been talking about. Um, right. Uh, it's convenient to be able to select a representative from each ray. Do you understand me? All the vectors in a ray name the same thing. And there are two different ways of doing that. Um, one way is to take the place where it hits this plane. <laughs> and then if you hit this plane, uh, a, a vector of negative norm corresponds to a point on the plane. And that's actually a point in hyperbolic geometry. Um, a vector of positive norm, well, we discuss what's orthogonal to it. And what's orthogonal to it, well, what's orthogonal to it, in the sense of this metric, what's orthogonal to it is, you know, I think I'll do, do this one. What's orthogonal to this is a plane which will intersect uh, our thing here. So this, uh, and... Uh, we, rep we represent, uh, how can I say it? This is the W such that W dot V equals naught. It's a plane, but it hits the surface of, uh, of this thing in a line. So when V dot V greater than naught, we use V, V to represent this line. It's the line of all points such that uh, all the points represented by W, vectors W, such as W dot V equals not. So, right. And then, well, we've, we'll, we'll discuss this kind later. It can be regarded as either a point or a line. There's another way to choose canonical representatives. And that is to make this into an ice cream cone. You take a blob of ice cream, a spherical blob of ice cream. And in this case, this, line, this vector v here will hit it in a point up there, say. And, and this uh, plane here will hit the ice cream in a circular arc perpendicular to the boundary. And, okay, uh, so this is a line. And this is a point. And so I'm going to compare this. What These models are traditionally known as the Poincaré model and the Beltrami-Klein model, except that people tend to leave Beltrami's name out of it, which I think is unfortunate. Klein has a lot of mathematics. Beltrami has rather less. Uh, the Beltrami Klein model. Um, and, uh, you know, this is plane, 
and lines are represented by line segments uh, that hit this, uh, well, it's usually called the conic, but in our case it's a circle, that hit this circle. So lines are straight. In this model, well, uh, it's, in, uh, it's on a sphere, a spherical disk, you might say, a spherical cap, um, but in inversive geometry, uh, a sphere is equivalent to a plane. <laughs> and so we can take it to a plane and take, uh, you know, a plane disk. This is a Poincaré disk model and replace it by a signal. So what, what actually happens, most people tend to prefer the Poincaré model for, the, uh, for certain reasons, uh, in which lines are represented by circular arcs orthogonal to the boundary. Um, uh, however, in a way, this Beltrami Klein model is really more natural. What happens is, if you were in hyperbolic free space looking at a hyperbolic two space, you see it in the Beltrami Klein model. Uh, this has this curious effect that the Quancari model is conformal, so you always see little regions in the same shape. You're always looking dead on them. They don't get foreshortened. Uh, that, let me remark that. <coughs> You know, the line in the Klein model that uh, represents uh, this line from the Poincaré model is just this straight line here. So everything gets squashed up to the boundary very quickly in the, in the Beltrami Klein model. And um, that's why, really, you see more in the Klein model, but you see it uh, in a curious way. You're always looking flat on to every single point, although the surface is really coming away from you. Okay, so now what was I going to say? Okay, so now I'm ready to discuss x squared plus y squared minus t squared. Um, uh, uh, the point, let's represent the point x, y, t by the Euclidean thing x over t, y over t. Sorry. In other words, basically, I'm normalizing so that t is 1. And then here is the origin. It's naught, naught, slash 1. What's the norm of that? Minus 1. Norm is, you evaluate this thing. Uh, okay, what's this line? Well, this line is, it's the x-axis. Uh, it uh, does is to say... Uh, it's the points with y equals naught, the points orthogonal to this. That's the x-axis. What's the norm of this vector? Oh, it's plus one. Okay. Oh, yes. Well, remember, I said things with negative norm are represented by points or represent points. Uh, things with uh, positive norm represent lines. So this vector represents a line. It's really rather funny. Points and lines get all mixed up. <laughs> uh, so that was the x-axis. Here is the y-axis with x equals north. Right. Now those vectors, all three of the vectors I've drawn so far, are root vectors. That is to say, uh, they serve as reflections. You know. So the reflection in this vector is the reflection in this line. Similarly, the reflection in that vector is and the reflection in this is the reflection in a point, which, which is actually a rotation geometrically. But let's continue to try and call it the reflection in a point. Now, all of those are symmetries. Let me discuss. Suppose you take R as a root vector. R takes X to X, this is a formula we've seen several times, minus twice X dot R over R dot R, R. <laughs> Okay, now r dot r is called the norm of r. Um, the level of r is the, uh, how can I say it, the common divisor of all the inner products. So this x dot r is a multi an integral multiple of the level. And this factor 2 introduces a 2 in there. So provided the norm divides twice the level, this piece here is always an integer and the lattice is preserved. 
Uh, well, that's true here. The norm is one. That will divide twice the level. A level is an inter integer. By the way, we're working now in the Gaussian definition in which um, all inner products are integers. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, there's another vector here. Uh, this vector is 1 minus 1, but I'll just call it plus minus slash 0. And its norm is 2. Okay. Oh, but, you know, it's an integral vector, so its level is at least 1. Uh, so its norm does divide twice its level. So, which is sort of fairly obvious anyway, the reflection across here is a symmetry. Right. Um, now, I, w I want to join these two points, but I'd better find out what they are first. Uh, well, this point is orthogonal to this factor, and that means its middle coordinate is zero. Uh, in fact, it's one naught slash one. It's where the, the uh, this horizontal line hits the circle, and that's at infinity because uh, x squared plus y squared minus t squared is zero. And zero points uh, are equally zero lines, in fact. Uh, they're at infinity. <laughs> okay, but that doesn't sort of seem to hurt us. Uh, now this is uh, not 1 slash 1 by analogy. Okay, so now I want to uh, find out what's orthogonal to both these. Okay, well, let's do it. Orthogonal to that one, suppose A, B, C is orthogonal to naught 1 slash 1 and to 1 naught slash 1. If it's orthogonal to this, that means B minus C equals naught. It's orthogonal to this if A minus C equals naught. So the simplest vector, you know, if any vector which satisfies both of those is proportional to 1 1 slash 1. So here is 1, 1, slash 1. What's its norm? 1 plus 1 minus 1, uh, 1 plus 1. So it's a line. Oh, well, that's right, it is a line. <laughs> we, we often don't know whether a thing is a point or a line until after the event. Let's work out what that point is. Well, uh, this, this time now we have A, B, C orthogonal to 1, 1, slash 1 and to plus minus a slash naught. We're taking the intersection of this line with this line. Uh, that means a plus b equals c, a equals b. So that's uh, 1, 1 slash 2. What's its norm? 1 squared plus 1 squared minus 2 squared minus 2. Ah, uh, so that's a point. <laughs> 1, 1 slash 2 minus 2. Okay. Well, all the vectors we've noted down there are actually root vectors. The root vector is one whose reflection preserves the lattice. And uh, so we've deduced that this lattice is invariant under the reflections in this triangle, the group generated by... And this is a fundamental region uh, for the group. And what is the group? This angle is pi over 4. This angle is pi over 2. And this angle is pi over infinity. And in my notation for hyperbolic groups in the plane, this is, uh, I put a star somewhere near the one of the things, and I, I call this star infinity for two. Um, and that's really quite interesting. Now let me go back and talk about this notation for a little bit. Um, it works in the spherical space, in uh, Euclidean space, and in hyperbolic space. And it's perhaps more familiar in spherical space. So I'm going to take a cube, but I'm cheating here. This uh, isn't really a Euclidean cube, it's a spherical cube. So, it, you know, make it out of some sort of slightly flexible turn and then blow into it and it will inflate to a sphere. But I'm, I'm going, I really mean that sphere, but it's easier to draw things on a cube. So, what do we say? We say, I think, I would really, I'd love to have a different colored pen, but then uh, we, we say, uh, look, here, the reflection in the equator 
is a symmetry of that. That interchange is top to bottom. Uh, here the reflection, there's another reflection of a similar type and another one. Okay, but then there's another reflection doing this, one doing this, one doing this, and, uh, uh. and uh, these reflections divide the surface of the cube, or more strictly speaking, the sphere that I'm sort of trying to draw them on, into lots of little triangles. Uh, that's a kaleidoscope, a spherical kaleidoscope. And I put a star near the kaleidoscope, and then I choose a fundamental region, which is going to be this one. Now look, four mirrors meet here, so uh, and they meet at angle pi over four. Uh, so, fine. Two mirrors meet here at right angles, which is pi over two. Three mirrors meet here. And the angle here is pi over 3. It's not on the cube, but on the sphere it would be pi over 3. So this group is star 4, 3, 2. And what did we have? Or if you like, star 3, 4, 2. It doesn't matter which you like. And we had before uh, star infinity, 4, 2. Well, the cube is the is a, a polyhedron which has cube there's a, a thing called the schlafly symbol of the cube um, and, the, uh, and that means that it's got squares three to a vertex okay and the group is star four three two um, uh, uh, our similar, you know, our group, well, let, let's say of the quadratic form x squared plus y squared minus t squared group, uh, well, it's for infinity. It's meaning squares infinity to a vertex, and the group, I'll rewrite it as star for infinity to. To get the comparison. So let, let's try and see the tessellation of squares of which this is a symmetry, uh, of which this is the symmetry group. Um, here's one of them. Okay, that's a square. It's got four straight lines and uh, they wherever they meet, they meet at infinity and the angle is zero which is pi over infinity. And now reflect this square in an edge, and you get this square. And then reflect it again, and, and again, and so on. And we, you know, we get this tessellation. This uh, is now analogous to the cube. It's, it's the polytope with squares infinitely many to a vertex. And our group has the reflections, I'll draw them in dotted lines now. The symmetries are generated by all the reflections that, uh, and by the way, there's a dotted line here, and so on too. Uh, these are beautiful groups in general. Um, okay, and that's, that's what the automorphism group of x squared plus y squared minus t squared. In 1940, Coxeter and one of his students, Whitrow, worked out what the automorphism group of x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus t squared was. Uh, I won't bother to explain it. And then that was taken up by other people and continued by Vinberg out to 20 dimensions. Uh, he found, well, and he was a, had in some cases, it was accompanied by his students in particular, a lady student, Miss Ka Kaplinskaya, Vinberg and Kaplinskaya, uh, took it out, and they found uh, that i n comma one, uh, that means sum of n squares minus one square. Uh, they, they found that the automorphism group of that was almost generated by reflections, provided n was at most nineteen, and almost means the reflections generate a subgroup of finite index. Um, and uh, 
then for 20 and above, the reflections uh, are of infinite index. Okay, but what I asked the students, my students for this course to do is to find some more examples, and uh, uh, three-dimensional examples. And here is the form x squared plus y squared minus 7t squared. Um, uh, so this time, the fundamental region is a pentagon. And it's a pentagon, straight sides, a pentagon with four right angles and one vertex of infinity, which is a cusp, at which, uh, you know, it's called a cusp, at which the angle is zero. Um, and it, over here, if you look rather closely, you can find the coordinates for the points, which are like the coordinates I put on for x squared minus y squared uh, minus t squared. The, uh, so you see, this is again a kaleidoscope group. I'm sorry, something's happened here. Ah, okay. This is again a kaleidoscope group. But they're not all kaleidoscope groups. If we um, make the coefficient of t b7, so we have uh, the form x squared plus y squared minus 7t squared, and then <coughs> if you do the calculations by which uh, we found these groups, um, you find this reflection group. Uh, all, all of these are reflections here. But then when you look at this, it seems that there's a symmetry. Uh, look, um, this factor has norm minus 14, and uh, at that point there's a right angle. This factor has norm minus 14. 7 squared plus 0 squared minus 7 times 3 squared. 49 minus 63 is minus 14. That vector has no minus 14 and a right angle at it, and so on. It appears the rotation around that point um, uh, is uh, the, the 180 degree rotation about that point. But that is a symmetry. Uh, and indeed it is. Uh, that point, now you see, if what's the image of this under, let's call this V. The image of this is represented by some linear combination of this vector and v. And we're saying that it's that vector. Okay, um, so v is a linear combination of these two. And by symmetry, it's either the sum of the difference. <laughs> uh, by the way, a, a vector and its negative represent the same point. <laughs> uh, so one can't distinguish the sign carefully. Well, in fact, uh, uh, two one slash one, which is the difference of these two vectors, is also the difference of these two vectors. And so that's going to be the answer. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the norm of this vector is two squared plus one squared minus seven times one squared is minus two. Oh yes, so it's a root vector. Uh, its norm divides twice its level. Um, okay, so this now is a twofold cone point. Um, and uh, so the answer is, uh, I asked this question, is it the reflection group here? That's what the reflection subgroup is, the geometrical reflection subgroup. Uh, but the whole group is 2 star for 2. And let me explain now something of what this symbolism means. Damn it. There's no... Uh, there's no brick wall around here, but you remember what a brick wall looks like usually. Uh, so here's the brick wall group. This, uh, this group here that we're just saying is very like the brick wall group. So here's a brick wall. And now I'm going to draw what the reflections are. I'm going to draw them dashed so that you can distinguish them from certain other lines in the figure. There's a reflexive symmetry running down the line, running down the center line of any course of bricks. And then there's also vertical reflections here. So I'm not doing it very well. But let me concentrate now on this region. So uh, I'm going to draw it a bit bigger. Uh, 
Uh, where are we? Those, uh, these lines are, are what the reflection group looks like. And this is really rather similar to this figure, as you'll see in a minute. Um, so, the, uh, and we've just got it as what the reflection subgroup of the symmetries of a brick wall is. There is what it looks like. Okay. Um, now this this is called the orbifold of that reflection group. We've just folded. We've identified any two points that differ by a reflection one of these lines. So the paper gets folded on itself, and, and the infinite plane gets folded onto this thing. Uh, but now there's another symmetry of the brick wall, which is to turn it upside down. Okay, and that uh, that symmetry we didn't take account of. And it's a rotation of order two about that point in the center. By the way, there were reflections the reflection subgroup was star two 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 two. Can you put that on the up, up here? Uh, yeah, the reflection subgroup was star two 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 two. But we're about to adjoin this rotation. I haven't done it yet. Um, now, what, what, what uh, these symbols name is actually what the orbifold of the group looks like. And the orbifold is what you get by identifying any two points that are equivalent to the group. And we've already, under the group, we've already identified points that are equivalent by reflection. But now we're going to do points that are equivalent by this rotation, and we do it like that. Okay, so we get this funny little topological object here, which is called the Orbifold. John <laughs> is, is worrying, so I can't sort of swing around the way you should ideally if you want on the catwalk, but um, uh, but John is wearing, was wearing, the orbifold of a brick wall, okay? And now, what, uh, what is this? Well, this is, uh, topologically, this is a disk, okay? But uh, it, it, uh, the, the points there aren't always ordinary sort of points where it's locally flat. No, there are some points which are on the boundary, uh, okay? And uh, so, and the boundary is what's indicated by the star in the notation, really. And then it has two corner points where the, the by the way, a typical point of the boundary has half a revolution of space around it. At the corner points here, it's a quarter of a revolution. It's been halved again. Um, and there are two of those. So that boundary is described by star 2-2. Two, two. Star names the fact that there is a boundary and the numbers after it follow, tell you what the corner points are. And then this is a different kind of point. It's, uh, it's an internal point, it's a cone point. It's still true, there's, a, there's only half a revolution's worth uh, of space around here. It's a different kind of half to what happens here. And this is what happens when you have a gyration, that is to say, a rotation that fixes the point but no reflection fixes the point. Um, and this is what's called, so, you know, you see, th this was star two, 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 but when we identify it, we'll get a star two, two there, and two star two, two, we're up to time? Oh. What, what's happened here? Oh, I see, I'm covering up the thing. So, uh, that, that square is the orbifold for star 2222, two, 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 the reflection subgroup. When I adjoin the rotation about here, we only get, the four corners become two, 
it's only star 2, 2, and a new singularity appears in the middle, which isn't a corner, but a code point. So this is 2 star 2, 2. I usually write gyration points rather larger, um, or else I write them in a different colour. Um, okay, well, what happened to, uh, to this group was, well, we still had a quadrilateral. However, it's not a rectangle, it's got two right angle corners and two half right angle corners. Um, and its reflection part was this, when you adjoin the rotation about that point, that we get two star four two. Um, yes, what's the time? How much time have I got? About it? Okay, so, um, so then, okay, thank you. Uh, this is, you ought to hear some students tomorrow explaining how these things were found and various other things. Okay, thank you.